Hi, everybody. My name is Ashwin Vaidyanathan, and tonight I'm excited to introduce the CEO of Robin Systems, Mr. Premal Butch. Pramal earned his master's degree and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science at Cal. He then began his career at Magma Design Automation, where he helped the company become the fourth biggest electronic design automation company in the world. As the head of design implementation, Pramal was responsible for two thirds of Magma's revenue. He continued to make an impact as VP of software engineering at Altera. Under his leadership, Altera introduced the first OpenCL compiler in the industry for FPGA-based hardware acceleration and created the Altera, virtu uh, Altera Virtualization Lab. In talking with Pramal, he excitedly shared his belief that data explosion is going to drive a lot of the things we do and that the next 10 years are going to be very exciting for data science, a vision that I full-heartedly agree with. Looking to take advantage of this golden data opportunity, Pramal currently serves as president and CEO of Robin Systems, an enterprise software startup that creates intelligent, elastic, and high-performance infrastructure for modern data applications. Closing a recent round at $15 million, Robin Systems has now raised $22 million in total funding. Please join me in welcoming Pramal Buk to the stage. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Ashwin. And thanks, Vicky, for giving me the chance to be here. What I have here is uh, I'm going to kind of trace through the things uh, that I've done since I left Cal and hopefully share some of those things. And if there are this time at the end, talk a little bit about what I'm doing now. Uh, so before we get into any of that, so just to give you a brief background, um, I did my bachelor's uh, in India uh, at Bits Pilani, and I came uh, to Berkeley in 92 uh, for my master's. And uh, my master's was with Professor Ku uh, in circuit simulation. Uh, and then at somewhere along the way, uh, we uh, had this grad uh, course in logic synthesis. And I don't know if you still do this or not, but at that time, uh, senior students would offer course projects from the research they were doing. And I signed up for one of those course projects. That got me into my uh, PhD topic. And uh, I ended up uh, working for Professor Newton. I was talking to Dale earlier, uh, you know, in those days, probably still today, uh, the system was that you were working for a professor. Uh, he was funding you. And uh, you published papers, cited, uh, you know, they were one of the author list. So I published my coursework project, uh, it became a paper. I put Professor Ku's name on it, and then uh, he, I gave it to him for review, and he says, you know, this is great, but uh, I shouldn't be on the author list. I was really worried that, you know, I, this, I have done something wrong. I offended him, he's not happy that, you know, I'm working with another professor. Uh, so I was trying to figure out, he said, well, you know what, just because I'm funding you doesn't really mean that uh, I'm one of the authors, so you, know, you should uh, work with Professor Newton, uh, acknowledge me, but that's about it. And I, I mentioned that because uh, you know, that's a very rare thing among professors. And uh, Professor Ku recently passed away. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, I'm happy to be back because, uh, you know, as with him passing away, I felt like there was one less connection for me uh, with Cal, and I'm just happy to be back here and, you know, doing something, uh, getting involved in some ways. So that was 95. Then I uh, moved over to Professor Newton's group, did my PhD, and then uh, I joined Magma. Magma at that time was... Uh, a five people company and we kind of grew. Uh, we went public in 2001 uh, and uh, uh, subsequently in 2012. So we were, uh, as Ashwin said, we are the fourth biggest EDA company for a good 10 years or so. And then uh, uh, in 2012, we were acquired by the biggest company in the space, Synopsys. Uh, at which point I joined Altera. I just, you know, it's kind of after competing with another bigger company for 10 years, it didn't really feel right going and working for them. So I said, I want to do something different. Ended up uh, joining Altera, and then uh, earlier this year, uh, joined Robin. So, you know, going back to how I started uh, at Magma, uh, and I was trying to, you know, sort of retrace things and see what's the moral of the story here. And I think one of the first things I would say for if you are thinking about joining a startup or starting one of your own, uh, make sure you've got really good, strong technical people. So. The magma stories, I, I highlighted this. Uh, when I graduated, I interviewed with uh, a 
companies, big and small. I, the biggest one I interviewed was Intel. The smallest one was a, a four-people company. And it was not Magma. Um, and this was in the summer of 97. I was at IWLS, which, was a, which is a logic synthesis workshop uh, held in Tahoe every year. It's kind of like a Berkeley get-together. Either people, Everybody there is either from Cal or people who have a Cal connection. Um, and so there were these three uh, guys who were starting a company. They didn't really have a Berkeley connection. They were there just recruiting and talking to people. And uh, I was actually pretty impressed with them. They were seasoned professionals, you know, been in the industry for a long time. Um, and I talked to them, uh, you know, I came back a month later, I interviewed with them, and they made me an offer. And so I had all these different uh, size companies, and I, you know, all things being equal, I want to join a startup. Um, so I was set to take their offer, and then I found out that uh, somebody who was a few years ahead of me at Cal uh, was uh, one of the founders at Magma. So I sent him an email on Friday evening and uh, said, you know, are you guys interviewing? So he said, yeah, sure, let's talk. So I said, I have this offer that expires Monday. Can we talk before that? So he said, okay, come on over Saturday morning. I went over uh, and talked to uh, Hamid, who was uh, uh, also a Cal PhD and the other co-founders. Um, and they said, yeah, we'll give you the same offer that those guys gave. Um, so now I had two companies doing identical things and identical offers, I had to pick one. And the, my criteria was that the first company had the CEO, the VP of engineering, and director of engineering in place, and no engineers. The other company, the founders were engineers, the guy who was a CEO was also an engineer, you know, just, he had done a couple of things before, but, you know, very hands-on kind of guy. So I figured, you know, I'm just coming out of school, I don't want to be the first engineer in a startup, I don't know, you know, I'll be over my, in over my head. And I ended up joining Magma. Uh, and that worked out, that worked out really good because A, there are other people who you know, took similar decisions. We ended up putting together a really good uh, team. Uh, Rajiv had uh, done a couple of other EDS startups before uh, and fundraising was not a problem. And we just went on a more on a growth uh, path. The other company actually after three years or so it ended up folding. Um, and I say this because I see this even today. Um, you know, we go out raising money, people want to know who, are who is involved in the company. And it's, it, that name association uh, matters at every stage. Uh, you know, if you've got tier one VCs, it's easier to raise money and get other people involved. Uh, if you've got uh, people who have got a lot of brand name, and that brand name can come in a couple of different ways. People who have been in the industry before, done, led big teams, done big, th created things. That's one. These days, at least in CS, if you've got a big uh, open source profile, you're very active in meetups in the you know, community, that carries a lot of weight. Uh, so make sure either you, if you're one of those, then great, you'll probably be able to get uh, really good traction. But if you're not, make sure you pick companies where you can see people who have done it before, who are going to make it easy for everybody else to win. So that would be one uh, thing I would say, you know, you know first step out of, out of school, look out for something like that. You know, what's the core DNA, what's the core team? And that will have a lot to do with where the company ends up going. <coughs> so the other thing, then we, uh, we, we, start, we started the company. Um, we're still, uh, you know, small company dominated by two or three big companies in this space. And uh, uh, everybody was talking about similar things at that point of time. And we felt we could execute better uh, but bigger companies are also saying the same thing. So I said this, don't market small, because we came up with this, uh, which is really a gimmick. Uh, we, this was about closing timing uh, in your place in the outflow. And we said that there is a point at which if you, uh, if the tool says you meet timing, you'll meet timing at the end on uh, silicon. And if don't, you know, we'll get all of your license uh, money back. And really, uh, there are enough caveats that nobody ever really asks us for our money back. But uh, that was something, you know, it is fairly conservative area at that time. And we, you know, we came out the first uh, conference we were in. Um, and, you know, everybody was kind of taken aback by this young startup trying to be really brash and confident about what they were doing. And that really put us on the map. There were, I meet today, 15 years later, uh, people who still remember uh, how we launched the product. And I think the takeaway here, apart from that uh, marketing gimmick, uh, is that you know, when you go out, uh, you want to go to trade shows, do a few things, but do them big. Make sure that people remember you. There are a lot of companies you can go and there'll be a small booth somewhere in a conference in a corner, not a lot of traffic. 
That's the most depressing thing you can do uh, just from the customer traction point of view, but even for your own employees. You don't want your team to come back demotivated about the company because nobody wanted to talk to you. So just make sure that whatever you decide to do, do it big. This was another lesson we learned. This was about three years into the company, uh, and uh, we were getting ready uh, to go public. And uh, at that time, we were, uh, we, we were looking at the IPO to raise a bunch of money. And uh, our bankers and advisors should do a mezzanine round that you know, uh, go to uh, private VCs first, get some money in the bank before you go public. And there are a whole bunch of us uh, doing this for the first time uh, who were not too happy about it because we said, okay, you know, we're just about to go public. Now we're going to get diluted by X percent. Um, we're not happy about it, but uh, you know, we figured that these guys know what they're talking about. And that ended up being, you know, it made a difference between the company making it or not because uh, the next thing that happened, so we, we had a good pub, uh, IPO, but if you look at the date here and here between this, 9-11 happened. So we were set to go public uh, September, 9-11 happened, everything shut down. And if we hadn't done the mezzanine round, the company would not have been able to meet payroll. We were just counting, I mean, the money was, we could see the money. Right, and everything just went, just froze. And we ended up going public. Uh, it was two months later, but that's, you know, the company came this close to shutting down from a super successful company, which was still running. It was not, uh, you know, making money, but the growth rate, everything was all lined up. And, but for that, you know, that extra few percent we were trying to optimize for, we would uh, have, you know, just shut down. And this is something we talk about today as well. Uh, even today, Robin is a much smaller company. You know, today, dilution is also more if you raise uh, you know, more money. But with the markets the way they are, you know, we have raised enough money. If we talked about 15 million, that's good for six quarters. Who knows in six quarters if there is another bubble bursting. You know, the rates go up, money dries up. You don't want to be raising money when you still haven't met your goals. So there is no such thing as having enough money in the bank. If you get, if you can make, uh, you know, raise money, take it off the table. I think that's one thing we learned as we're doing this. So we went public. Now this is, uh, there's nothing to do with any of my life stories, except that it's not all about ECS. We, uh, the same week that we went public, there was a company with a ticker symbol, Woof, and they were a pet healthcare company, and we would just laugh at them. The stock was down after the first week, and we were just also full of ourselves, you know, a high-tech startup and all that. And the reason why I bring that up is that this is, we got acquired three years ago. Woof is still around. This is Woof performance relative to NASDAQ. So there are multiple ways to make money. It doesn't have to be your latest uh, open source big data startup. So just keep that in mind. Uh, otherwise, there is no other moral here beyond that. Okay, so, there, so now we are public, you know, we're, uh, we're getting to a point where uh, I had been managing engineering teams, uh, bigger and bigger teams. Uh, at some point, I want to do something a little bit different. So uh, we were going, we were organized engineering, marketing, and sales. Uh, with the company growing wider, we said we'll go business units and uh, so different product line business units. So uh, we're looking for people to take their entire uh, business unit role. And so I, I was, generally good with customers. And so I said, you know, I, I'll do that. It's an interesting way to diversify into something else. And uh, you know, I figured I'd done presentations, no big deal. Um, so the first thing I learned was that marketing is not an easy job. And I, what I mean by that is that when you are an R&D guy and you go to customers, even if the tool sucks, it's crashing, the customer sees you as a potential solution to the problem. They want to talk about technology, they want to figure out what's going on in the tool, maybe they can help themselves, or you, you know, they can convince you that you know, we, we maybe we need to do something different to solve the problem. When you're a marketing guy, the only thing they're doing is inflict enough pain so that you go back to the headquarters and say, we need to do something about this. So that business card change made a big difference in my worldview of what it feels like to be out defending the product. I always thought the product was cool and you know, go and have interesting conversations with the uh, customers about how cool it was. And once I got into a marketing role, that changed completely. So I would uh, never underestimate uh, the marketing side of the story. Um, 
the second part, uh, this is just, I learned along the way, uh, focus on what the audience cares about. And what I mean by that is, we would go and talk about how our stuff was, you know, 10% better and 20% smaller and uh, faster and so on and so forth. They were always very excited about a new release that did all these XYZ things. And I fairly quickly learned that most of the time we were just talking to ourselves. Uh, people really want to see how it makes a difference to them. And I think it's, it is a big difference in, you can take the same technology, same uh, slides, but slant them differently and you get a very different response uh, from the uh, audience. I think that's something you need to learn the right way. And the second part of this is uh, tell a story. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, when I'm not talking about, you know, telling personal anecdotes and things like that. Uh, but when you go to a customer, they've got a bunch of other vendors coming and talking about the same thing, you know, how their stuff is better than everybody else's. And you tune those things out after a while. So, you know, I've been on the purchasing side, and everybody comes and says they are the greatest things in uh, slice bread, and you kind of filter it out. What you really want to know is what they did for somebody else. So if you can typically get a bigger customer in an area and say, you know, this is what we did with so-and-so um, -so customer. So for Magma, it was uh, one of our, some of our big customers at uh, Texas Instruments, uh, Qualcomm, Broadcom, would go to smaller guys and anonymize this, so, you know, would not uh, talk about what Qualcomm or Broadcom was doing, but we would talk to them about how we help Qualcomm. And the guys who are, we, would be, we would be talking to, now they would perk up. They didn't really care about what Magma was doing, but they wanted to know how Qualcomm got better or Broadcom got better. And because that helped them, you know, both in their day job and also, you know, in positioning things internally in whatever department politics they had, you know, whoever was trying to bring a new thing in, that really clicked. So I think when you are pitching your technology, uh, talk about how it helps somebody. And if you can give an example of how it helps somebody prominent, big, you know, sort of a reference in a design, in that space, even better. And the flip side of that is that if you are doing something of your own, uh, try to figure out who is a good development partner because a big customer can really put you on the map. In Magma's case, it was TI. So we had got a lot of small customers. Uh, TI worked with us and we had, they, the tool broke all over the place. Uh, it took us about a year to get TI to adopt it and deploy it. But when they did, the amount of buzz and the press we got, that really put us on the map. So I think a couple of customers like that can really make the difference. And you don't really necessarily make money at those customers. It's, uh, you can't justify it anyway. You know, it, uh, you know the, the revenue, the deal is not worth it. Um, you sink a lot of resources, R&D gets distracted. You end up doing one-off custom things for that customer. But you still get the other 80, 90% of the value you get. And that repeatable, referenceable, uh, you know, um, uh, benchmark that you get out of that, that really pays off. So I think when, whatever you are doing, look for who the big dog in that uh, customer base is and see if you can make them happy and then, you know, unlock a lot of things for you. Oh, and this is, um, this was my other learning when I started uh, managing marketing. The expense reports are very different between engineering people and marketing people. And my, I was trained well by the guy, but the Berkeley guy who was, I was reporting to, and who would scrutinize each of my lunch uh, expense report. And when I did that, the first time I did that with the marketing guy, he looked at me and said, do I need to really report to this guy? I mean, this is just, yeah, you know. So don't question what the marketing and sales guy, if you ever end up managing marketing and sales, expect them to be different from engineers. And I, I would say this, that everybody should at some point spend some time in marketing. I think it gives you a different perspective. And even today at uh, Robin, uh, you know, we have great technology. The time we are spending most on right now is how to position that because depending upon, and you know, if, I don't know if I'll get time to talk about what Robin is, but it's basically an infrastructure company. An infrastructure play can be really tricky. Uh, people can have very high threshold for, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, risk. So they, they really, you don't really want to put anything mission critical uh, on that. So how you position the company, whether you position this, it as an incremental thing or a complete change in the infrastructure, uh, it's very tricky. And many times you have to underplay the technology you have so that it's easier to roll it out. So that is the stuff we spend a lot of time on right now. So those skills, I think you know, some people just have that you know, good innate ability to market, but otherwise it comes from doing some of these uh, marketing rotations. So I think even if you are a strong engineering person, uh, if, you, if you want to do something on your own at some point, and even if you want to just grow in a bigger company, uh, working uh, in marketing will give you a very different perspective on how to roll out technology. Okay, so and this is uh, another thing we learned uh, along the way. So, you know, it, this is a very cliched statement, right? Plan for wild success. Uh, but I'll tell you how, uh, this is a very practical implication of that. Uh, we started Magma and then uh, in the early days, we were closing deals and we wanted the company to look bigger than it was. So, uh, you know, this was not the SaaS days. So it was still, we were doing mostly three year deals uh, that you would renew. And uh, so you can look at those deals two ways. You can look at uh, those deals as, uh, you know, that three year deal pays you, you know, a twelfth of it every quarter. Or you can claim that, you know, I made, signed this huge deal and then, you know, uh, get all the cash for it, you know, put it on your books and, uh, you know, the, your revenue obviously looks a lot bigger than it would otherwise because now you've got 12 times the revenue. It looks great. And as long as you keep growing, it's, it works wonderfully. You, uh, you know, close a million dollars worth of deal this year, then, uh, you know, and a million and a half next year, it's great. What happens is, and this is what we didn't anticipate, I think you, the company is growing, everything is looking good, and then as you grow, your growth starts slowing down. You really can't uh, do the same multiples you were doing before. <laughs> and now, if you have collected all that cash up front, now suddenly, you know, when your quarter is a little bit lower than last time, it is still incrementally you are making more money, but now people are seeing that you made two million last quarter, now you're down. And that can really spook investors and create all kinds of problems. So the reason why I say this is that when you're starting something new, make sure you set the right processes in place. It's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle <coughs> once you get big. And this cost us a huge reset. I mean, we were a public company at that time. Uh, we reset our guidance, the uh, stock you know, tanked, and we built it back up. But this wasn't f fun. So I think you know, that's one thing I would uh, really caution that, you know, it may seem like a little thing when you are a four or five people company, but, you know, fast forward, what would happen if you are a big successful company uh, and make sure that you've got the right things in place. So now you are getting into, you know, bigger, I and mean, this I actually more than Magma, I experienced this uh, at Altera, which is a much bigger company, a lot more focus on people development, uh, making sure you talk to people, look at their aspirations, and give them a path to grow and all that. Um, and I say this because uh, when you are, if you're running a baseball franchise, you need to look at who you have in the farm system, uh, who is coming up, uh, who is going to be ready in a couple of years. And when you go out and sign free agents, you almost never can build an entire team out of your farm system. I mean, you would love to. Uh, but practically that never works. But you want to make sure that the free agent deals you're handing out, they are not blocking your uh, up and coming guys. Uh, so you need, you need to do a nice blend of people who are cheap farm uh, system folks and the people you uh, pay a lot of big money for. And you almost inevitably find that the guys you get as free agents are never really worth the money. But the overall payroll works out. Uh, it's a lot like that when you're managing a big company. You will have to go and hire people who are architects and fellows and uh, CTOs and things like that. Uh, but you also want to make sure that you've got all the new grads coming up and you know, not every new grad coming in is going to really become your architect, but some of them will. And I think you need to make sure that you are investing in those people, you're getting enough of those in the first place and investing in them to make sure that they are uh, kind of moving up the ladder. And you kind of look ahead and say that, you know, what do I need? so that in a year or two years, I'll have the right person for the right job. And this is something which is less of a startup problem. Startups really don't think beyond six months. But if you're in a bigger company, this is something you need to worry about. And at Altera, we would have succession planning. So really the idea was that any senior manager 
had to make sure that they had a successor for themselves who could take over if that person ended up quitting. And you had to have two or three people who were ready. And this is not really very ultra specific. This is pretty much all big companies do that. And you can do that kind of in a lip service way. Uh, there are people who really don't do uh, a good job of it because you know if you don't want somebody who's really good ready for your job because then you might actually get eased out of it. So there are a lot of people who don't do that, but don't be scared. I mean, you know, if you the the people I have seen succeed are the people who didn't worry about what would happen to them if somebody really good came up their organization, because typically companies want those kind of people around anyway, and you end up growing. Uh, you know, when people, the entire team under you is growing. This was the other thing I learned that bigger is not always better. And you know, when Magma grew rapidly in the early 2000s, uh, we, we grew here, we grew in India, we grew in China, we were, you know, we were just everywhere. We had every project that we want to do, we were putting bodies uh, and you know, just hiring and, and getting new people on board. And then the meltdown happened and we ended up uh, doing a series of uh, layoffs, uh, which was in itself a very painful thing and a lesson you know, you know, why you shouldn't really have unplanned uh, growth. But interestingly, you know, what I found was that with 70% of the uh, team, we ended up being a lot more efficient than we were when we were much bigger and bloated because we really had to pick and choose what we were going to do. We ended up cutting projects that really were not going anywhere anyway. And people became a lot more efficient because there are less distractions. Uh, the, uh, you know, there was a very clear uh, script on what we wanted to do to get out of the downturn we are in. Uh, and I think that was a lesson to me that you know, really, instead of having a lot of okay people, try to have a few really good people. Um, I mean, you know, now we are in a startup, uh, you know, really we would not want to go to a uh, offshore strategy until we really have to, because a few people who can sit together in a single space and work together can really almost always create something a lot more than more people all over the place working from home, working remotely. So they, you know, don't give up on that energy of a small team. And so I think the last thing is, uh, you know, you can plan for everybody. You can have this uh, farm system and do all these things. Have a plan for yourself uh, as well. So I think the first thing uh, that obviously a lot of you probably have to think about is grad school or not. And I think that's, uh, you know, for me, uh, I always wanted to go to grad school, I was not really sure about whether I want to do a PhD or not. I kind of drifted into a PhD. Uh, I remember that uh, you know, when we came in, uh, we, were, we had to take our prelims after the first year. And the mindset was that people, there were a couple of people in our class who didn't take the prelims, they just finished a master's and left. And you know, the way we would talk about them, uh, everybody talked about them, say, you know, so-and-so is you know, quitting after master's. So there was this sort of quitting mindset that if you are not doing a PhD, you're kind of quitting midway. Um, I wouldn't really you know, do a PhD for those reasons, although I ended up uh, doing it and I am very happy I did. Uh, I think you end up learning a lot. You get a lot of, uh, you, know, you get the ability to uh, sort of think about things that you don't really otherwise get uh, in sort of the grind of the coursework, uh, which continues you know, up to the master's. So I think the able to do independent things, uh, pick your own problem, come up with your own things, that I think helps a lot. You, you get those two or three years, uh, which are somewhat without a lot of pressure, where there is a lot of unstructured uh, things you can do. So I think that that's, there are intangible benefits to this beyond whatever you end up publishing. And you know, if that leads to, you want to be a professor, then obviously you need to do that. But even if you don't want to do that, you want to go to a industry job, I think that adds a lot of value. Uh, I also find that you know, particularly if you get a PhD from a place like here, then uh, that carries with you all the way. I mean, even today, uh, what I'm doing has very little to do with my PhD thesis, but I still get very different reception compared to some of the other folks in the team who are you know, in a similar role, uh, but just don't have the same degree pedigree. Now, is it worth uh, the time? I think that's a, the extra three or five years. I think that's something you need to decide for yourself. But I think certainly I was very happy I did that. And that, even today, it helps me. So the next question is startup uh, or a big company. And I think, again, that it's a personal decision. I, uh, I went the startup way. I wanted to, if I, there was an interesting startup out there, I wanted to work in it. Uh, I think you could learn different things both ways. 
the one thing I would make sure that you do is if you go to a big company, uh, you can do it for multiple reasons. Maybe you are just a people person who wants to be in a bigger company environment. Uh, but bigger company also, you can make a bigger impact. You can, there is a, it's a bigger boat, maybe take a little bit uh, long, longer time to turn, but you can make a bigger impact. So it's nothing to uh, you know, look down upon. But if you go to a bigger company, make sure that it's a company where it's kind of aligned with what you're trying to do long term. Um, and I think that's a critical thing. There are many companies where you can just get stuck on some side project uh, where it really doesn't do anything for a career. So I think uh, as important as it is to pick a company, it's also see how people have grown. You know, is there a history of people leaving that company and doing other interesting things? Uh, because unless you plan to retire in that, from that company, probably going to be leaving at some point and doing something different. And I think there are companies where uh, people just end up spending 8, 10, 15, 20 years. There are companies where people do something for three, four years, go out to do different things. So again, depending upon what you want to do, that's, I would make a, make a very conscious decision. Don't just make it based on the uh, comp or the very local job offer. Look at what it will do for you in three to four years. And does it put you in a place where you want it to be? Um, and this is very important. I think, you know, keep learning. Uh, I know a lot of people who uh, got to a point at, you know, they've been in a company eight or 10 years, and then they feel they're not marketable anywhere else. Because what happens is the longer time you spend in a company, your, your value gets very high. But it's very context specific. So it's very high to that company, but not always high in the open market. And I think if you are not continuously reinventing yourself, learning new things. You will get to this point where you will find that suddenly you are a little too old to do something new. You are making just enough amount of money to take a career reset. And you will be in this uncomfortable thing where you can, you know, you can keep going, but it's not quite exciting anymore. But you just don't know what to do. And I think if you keep learning, that's, you know, that makes sure that you, know, you don't stagnate. And you can move around, you can change companies, or you can just learn and do different things. And uh, EDA is uh, a classic example. So I, I moved out from EDA to uh, big data. Uh, but there are a lot of people uh, in EDA who are looking at uh, doing similar transitions. EDA, when I uh, came out of school, it was an exciting area. There was uh, you know, a lot of new startups coming up. Uh, today, it's mostly a three or four big company play. There are very few startups there. So uh, there are people who like that, but there are a lot of people who want to do something different. Uh, and you know, there you've got the same three to five percent uh, annual growth. Uh, you are focused more on margins and things like that. It's not very exciting. Uh, and if you want to do that, make sure you can. You know, if you learn, or you know, if you know how to pivot, you can do that. So I, what I mean by that is, I know I talk to a lot of people. You know, just career advice. I you know meet them for coffee. People who were in my team before are looking to do different things. Uh, and you know, I tell them that look, you want to go from EDA to something more exciting. Uh, go work for Amazon uh, or Google, not because that's where you want to work for 10 years, but you go to a bigger company, which is a dominant player in that area, you will learn things, you will get it on your resume, and then, so don't think of that as an end by itself, but that will, after two years, you can go do something different, and then you will be perceived very differently from being in that same company for eight or 10 years. Uh, but ideally, don't let it get to that point. You know, keep learning, keep doing different things, and stay current. Because I think that's the one thing you can do, and which I came very close to doing. It. I spent uh, 15 years in a single company. Um, it was interesting. I, you know, when I, after Magma, I was interviewing uh, at Alter, I, uh, you know, I thought uh, being in a company at 15 years, you know, I was uh, like, people would love it, you know, that I was a company person, I was, didn't move around, you know, a lot of people who move around every year, they job hop. Uh, I actually had to go and defend why you know, I stayed with that company for 15 years. And you know, I thought it was a success story, and I ended up being defensive about it. Uh, and the other interesting thing was now when we are uh, raising money, uh, I end up uh, highlighting my magma um, uh, past because VCs want to see people who have been in a small company have grown it uh, as opposed to being uh, you know, in, I had a bigger team at Altera, but they just uh, you know, want to see somebody who kind of was on that growth path as opposed to maintain and slowly increase, right? So you end up uh, spinning different things different ways. Uh, you know, it, is, it really depends on what you want to do, but make sure that whatever you do, you do it with that three to five year horizon so that you don't end up being a lot of greedy optimizations 
and getting stuck in a local minima. That's the worst thing you can end up doing career-wise. So that brings me to my pivot, which is uh, I ended up uh, going from EDA to big data. And I, I have a few slides. I'm not going to give you our company pitch. If you are interested, you can always go and look at our website. Uh, but I'll tell you what we are trying to solve. So what is happening is that uh, if you look at uh, a lot of the virtualization solutions out there, um, you know, VMware is the biggest company in this space. They're all uh, designed when uh, the uh, need of the day was operating system heterogeneity and uh, trying to increase your server utilization. You're running big applications on big servers. Now people are talking about running highly distributed big data applications. There's a lot of data to move, uh, that you need to move around, and you need to do it over uh, nodes, clusters of hundreds of nodes. And what you see out there is that you know, there are big companies, the Google, Yahoo, Facebook, they've got an entire vertical stack, everything customized for what they're trying to do, and then they have open sourced it. Uh, and uh, this is the good news is that if you want to put together a data pipeline, uh, you, know, you want to have an application company trying to do some market intelligence based on a lot of data, it's very easy to hook together, you know, stitch together a pipeline of all these open source tools. Uh, so you can get up and running very quickly. Uh, problem also is that for everything that you can think of, there is an open source flavor out there. And something is good at X, someone is good at Y, there is just a lot of confusion. It's, uh, open source is, is free, but it's not easy. So this is one problem that is out there today. And uh, there is not really the infrastructure to uh, make all these things run on big distributed uh, networks. So practical impact of that is things like this. So you have a lot of uh, storage costs. You end up, uh, uh, three-way copy is a very specific reference to how people have uh, resiliency in data to make sure if a node goes down, you don't lose data. Uh, but there is a lot of the, the, the way uh, you know, the storage needs are going up. People are just not able to keep up with it. And then on top of that, uh, all these applications don't share data. So you end up creating data silos. For each application, you need to copy over data and feed that application. Then you know, the output goes back into the persistent storage network uh, and you feed it to the next level of the pipeline. So all of those things are what we are trying to solve with a virtualization software. Now, so this is... Uh, what a typical stack looks like. You have all these different production, QA, and dev clusters, all these different applications. And I don't know if, you, you know, for those of you who are dabbling into big data, you've probably heard of things like Hadoop and Spark and things like that. The Spark work is, you know, a lot of it is done here. So, you know, Berkeley is at the leading edge of some of these uh, things. Uh, but suffice it to say that, you know, this is a very highly fragmented, siloed, uh, uh, environment, and that's the reason why you get all this underutilization of servers, a lot of data duplications, and the inability to get new applications up and running very quickly. Um, so this is the problem we are trying to solve. Uh, now again, I think, uh, why is this a very interesting time in the big data space? And this is now, this is not part of our company pitch. Uh, but there are a few mega trends, and I think this again, when you evaluate what you want to do, uh, look at where the, be on the right side of the mega trends. So if you look at uh, the virtualization space, uh, five years ago, it was all virtual machines, hypervisors. Now the big things are containers and dockers. So containers have been around for a long time in Linux. Dockers are sort of the more usable version of that. And uh, in the last two years, Docker itself is an open source concept. Docker company is a company built around it, like Red Hat for Linux. And they announced 400 million downloads uh, from their website. Um, and this was a few months ago. The number is uh, probably high right now. That's huge. And I mean, it's just, it's a small company worth a couple of billion dollars. Uh, you know, when you start talking to VCs, there is this phrase called unicorn companies, companies with a valuation, private companies with a valuation of more than a billion dollars. Docker is one of the uh, leading ones in that. So this is, already the next big thing on the uh, sort of the big data virtualization side. And you can see this today, uh, there, is, uh, there are much bigger companies out there. VMware is a huge company with lots of uh, you know, business, but facing a lot of questions about their future because of little companies like this with a lot of buzz. So that's mega trend number one. 
this is the other one, um, uh, Amazon. And I think, and so people have known about AWS for a long time, right? What happened this year was early this year, Amazon started reporting their AWS quarterly numbers separately. They did it primarily because people were talking about how uh, cloud is a commoditized, low margin business, Amazon must be losing money, how are they ever going to make money out of this? So they started reporting uh, this year, uh, AWS money as a separate line item. And that has completely changed everybody's perception uh, in the uh, venture side, on the uh, you know, investment side, on what this is like. And so it has done two things. It, it immediately makes it very hard to get funded if you don't have a really good cloud story. Because people are looking at this and saying, in five years, it's going to be all cloud. And maybe it's going to take longer than five years. Right now, Amazon, uh, the 160 billion is what they've added to their market cap based on the perceived value of their AWS business. So it is 16 billion a year, 10x multiple, multiple and you get 160 billion. And today they say, they don't even report the total market size for their um, AWS uh, business because they think it's irrelevant. They have only got two or three percent of the worldwide IT spend. So this is a huge trend. And the reason why this matters is that if you are building a product which is targeting a on-premise data center, so today everybody, not everybody's on cloud. A lot of people are, you know, most of the spend is on on-premise uh, big data centers. The buzz, once it is against you, you need to, you finding, you know, going upstream. The CIOs you are selling to, they are getting pressure from their management about, you know, what's their cloud story. So now, if you are trying to increase the spend on the non-cloud side, it becomes a little bit harder. There's still a lot of money to be made here, but I think it's another mega trend that I think you need to be on the right side of. And the third thing that I think hasn't gotten the same level of press, but I think it's going to make a huge difference is uh, the 3DX point uh, memory. And I, I don't know if this has uh, really got on your radar yet, but uh, just a few weeks ago, Intel announced uh, a major breakthrough in memory technology. So DRAMs have been around for a long time, uh, and uh, you try to optimize, make the transistor as efficient as possible to make it as compact as possible. With 3DX point, they are saying that uh, they can have wires cross each other, and uh, with the change in potential over that crossing, they can flip a bit. So that's significantly more compact, uh, significantly faster. So now you get uh, uh, DRAM a uh, thousand x faster than uh, NAND flash. So DRAM type of uh, speeds with a lot better resiliency. And this, I think, is going to change a lot of uh, uh, you know sort of deployments out there because now you can have terabytes of data on your machine locally without having a big storage network. So I think these are some of the things that we are looking at. And I'm not even going to give you a product pitch of how we are looking at this, but we think that we can take these trends together and craft a story where we can build an infrastructure for tomorrow, which will be relevant now for people who are trying to deploy big data, but it will become even more relevant as some of these trends become more and more prominent. So that's our uh, uh, mission. Uh, Reimagine and reinvent infrastructure the current IT infrastructure is designed for a different set of needs. We are trying to do that for modern data applications. So this is our standard vision slide. We are 35 people and growing. So I'll, you know, it's, this is something where if uh, you are ever interested in finding out more about Robin, go to our website and I'll be happy to talk to you more about what we are doing. Uh, and I think, yeah, so I won't go through these slides. I think these are slides that talk about what we are doing, which is a, you know, unique compared to everything else. And that is a product pitch I don't want to give you right now. Uh, so, wait, wait, maybe we want oh, to well, no, I'm sure, I, I, I don't mind. I, I, I give this presentation all the time, but I figured that you know, that's uh, probably you know, just uh, one too many buzzwords. But I think what, so I'll tell you, I'll give you a, a brief elevator pitch. What we are looking to do is uh, the trend when people are looking at uh, this, uh, big data applications is that people are trying to build their networks with hyper-converged nodes which try to have compute and storage everything in one node. And you just plug and play and build uh, you know, big networks. What we are doing, saying is that this is actually the opposite of what you want to do. You want to decouple compute and storage, have a big storage network where the storage nodes are optimized for capacity, compute nodes are optimized for performance, 
And then we, on top of that, on the storage side, we have a data-centric storage uh, solution where you build an entire storage uh, pool uh, of any, you know, just a bunch of devices, uh, disks, uh, you know, fiber channel, iSCSI, or uh, your hybrid cloud type of uh, cloud, you know, off-premise uh, storage. Uh, we do that. Uh, this allows you to lower your storage cost because now you can commoditize storage. You don't need to buy big, expensive storage boxes. Uh, and then we put a single global namespace over it. This is one of the big problems where different applications all need to look at their own private copies of data. And so by having a single namespace, we let multiple applications share data so that you are working only on a virtual little copy as opposed to taking terabytes of, uh, or petabytes of data and copying them all because that can take a huge amount of time. So the ability to get applications up and running very quickly is what we achieve with this uh, eliminated data duplication, data movement. And then on the compute side, we have caching, performance caching, because we'll, uh, one downside with all of this is that if your data is sitting all over the place in Virginia, in Oregon, uh, in the Valley, then the latency is going to kill you. So you need something on the uh, host side uh, to uh, accelerate the, the performance and make sure that you have the data when you need it. The good news is that you are typically working on a small amount of data and you don't need everything local, but you need to be intelligent about this. So there's a whole <coughs> caching analytics layer here to figure out what data you need and make sure it's available so that you still are seeing seamlessly the throughput you want. And on top of that, uh, we interface with Dockers and Mesos and all the different uh, open source solutions out there so that you can uh, roll it out in your um, uh, deployment. So that's sort of the full solution. So this, I think, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, one of the classic things that people talk about is if you are doing a startup, do something which is really small focused and uh, targeted, we are not doing that. We are trying to build something big. Uh, so which is, of course, there is a high risk to that. But on the other hand, if you can pull it off, there is also higher upside. So I think we have an opportunity to make a big difference here. Obviously, we'll see you know, how good we are at it. We, then we've got the funding to uh, execute and show that we can do it. So that's what we're going to be doing for the next uh, year, two years or so. I'll just stop there and then take any questions. Great. We want to open it up for questions. Um, I, actually, I'll start uh, with a question. Sure. I am curious to know um, if we were looking at headlines and you were kind of talking about marketing, mm -hmm. what would be the things that you'd ideally like to see in six months, one year, and two years for Robin Systems? For Robin. Um, so at, at six months, our most immediate focus is to uh, round out the product. We have got a uh, few early engagements underway. These are some of the customers I was talking about earlier about my Magma experience. We have got a few customers who really are big, challenging uh, engagements. But once we uh, get over those, that sets us up for uh, you know a very repeatable sales model deployment and a lot of referenceable uh, engagements. So our goal in the next three months is to uh, close out those engagements, get deployed, make the tool very robust, so that then after that we can start uh, you know, funneling and uh, you know going wide. So that's our uh, you know three month goal. At the six month level, we need to then uh, you know we, there are a couple of ways in which we can grow the company uh, to do more on the cloud side. There are a few things we can do where we can do hardware, software combined place, and really all of those things will depend on how good a job we do in the first six to nine months of filling the pipeline. So there are, you know, you can go for a very aggressive growth, you can throttle that back. Those are the kind of things that the decision will be making based on the success we have in the six to nine months. So I think right now where we are, I feel very good about the technology. We've got some really solid technology. Um, I want to have, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 nodes that we are deployed on in the next six months. And once we do that, then after that, it's just a question of uh, you know, scaling out, hiring more sales folks, more uh, marketing folks, more support folks to just make it bigger. Uh, so I think next six months are critical for us from that execution point of view. That's great. I'm going to open it up to some questions. Um, I just want to say something a little bit different, I suppose. Um, 
Preval has um, was at Cal for a while doing masters and PhD mm-hmm. work, but you never know who you're going to meet, and I think we keep hearing this as a, a theme. And so I just thought it was fascinating that um, you and Amit were actually roommates, who was our speaker uh, last oh, week. Yeah. So it wasn't yeah. intentional, but you know, just you know, make sure you you cultivate your friendships and and your roommates and and stuff. You never know uh, what's going to happen there. So I'm wondering if we have some questions. <coughs> I will ask yet another question. Yeah, I am well. curious. So you are now CEO. Mm-hmm. I am curious to know from you, can you tell us a little bit about what that is, like what your day looks like and how that's different from some of the other positions that you've had? Yeah, so the, you know, th- that's a very interesting question. Uh, Dale and I were talking about this earlier. So uh, there is, a part of the being a CEO is like running a very large team. And uh, you know, just running an engineering team is a little bit different from running a a multifunctional team. I had done that before. Uh, the the thing that is different is uh, the continuous selling aspect of it. You are either continuous into VCs, customers. Uh, you are continuously marketing and selling. So that's one. Uh, there are also little things you need to do. We uh, we are just uh, maxing out of the current space we are in. Uh, and we last month we are looking at five different places that we could move to. Uh, I never considered that you know going and visiting office spaces was a value add, but you know it was because I think we really needed a place where not only could we could have a bigger uh, sort of headcount that we could accommodate, but also our sales guys wanted to uh, get to a place where you know we could bring customers look bigger than we are. Uh, it was a big challenge for a startup, so we did that. So just yesterday I was signing the lease, and then I had to go and pick out uh, you know carpets because they said you know you know now need there is like one month you know we are going to paint the walls, whatever company colors and carpet. And so I finally said, okay, you know, I'll get somebody who are more is more aesthetically inclined uh, from the company to volunteer. But so there are things that you end up doing that you never thought you would do. But I think primarily, it is uh, being you know continuously selling uh, internally and externally. Right? So you're externally continuously pushing the company vision, but internally also you have to continuously be the cheerleader and you know get everybody excited. So I think that's one of those things where is when I was an engineering manager, I prided myself on being realistic. You know, being very rational and recognizing where we're not doing well, I think now you have to put a little bit of your marketing hat even internally and continuously talk about what we can be as opposed to all the issues that we are dealing with right now. So I think that the continuously trying to get people excited internally and externally is by far the single biggest change. Uh, so how, I mean, you have pretty uh, big goals. Mm-hmm. Are you all hiring for a lot of people now? You know, as you're gearing up? Strategy for that, for reaching some of these big goals. So we 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 have you know we are, we are hiring right now. Uh, we are hiring some in engineering. One of the things that we are doing now is you know uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, with the the three to six month ahead rollout in mind, we are also hiring in sales pretty aggressively. So yeah, they, you are continuously hiring, and so that's the other thing you learn, right? So there are you hire for two reasons. You hire because you you need people, but you also are continuously like I was talking about continuously selling. You also keep talking to people. You always learn when you interview people, even if it doesn't go anywhere. I am doing a lot more coffee meetings than I was before. Before I would, you know, there was a very structured uh, setting. You know, I'm in a bigger company. If there is a, you know, either there is an opportunity to do something or not. Now you end up meeting people who are doing something in an adjacent area. We just end up talking and saying, maybe there is a synergy, maybe there is not. So there is a lot of that continuously talking to people and networking that you end up doing also. Um. Ah. So when you were talking about Magma, you said it's better to go big Mm -hmm. and do a few events. Can you give an example of like something big that you did at Magma? So uh, Magma, you know, we, uh, there are a couple of things fairly early on. Uh, We, uh, DAC was the big conference, it still is in EDA. And 15 years ago, we, so you get to this conference, there are standard booths and, you know, with the big banners and all that. Uh, magma with the lava and the volcano theme, we created uh, our entire booth. We created a huge volcano, uh, and we, you know, we had to get into union arguments about what's allowed on the uh, exhibition floor and all that. But eventually, we, we managed to get that done. 
And uh, that was one of those things which was you know, eye-catching big. Uh, we had the launch party. We had, uh, again, a big Hawaiian volcano theme, and we had uh, you know, uh, people doing, you know, uh, we, we, almost, we almost had a performance you know, along with the, you know, the usual launch party. And I think, again, these are things that people still remember. 15 years later, I meet people who have long since moved on, they moved on, I moved on, but people still remember that Magma did this, uh, these things. And that's kind of so interesting. And like I said, that's what uh, put us on the map. And today, as Robin, we have got you know, a small budget. And so we, you know, what we try to do is we pick a couple of conferences and then try to have a big booth. These things are expensive. Uh, and so you don't want to have you know, multiple small tables be everywhere and be a $5,000, $10,000 table. You would rather have a big presence in a couple of big conferences and then not be present anywhere else. Uh, so that's how we are practically implementing it now. More questions? How you doing? <clears throat> Just got a quick yeah. question. Sure. So I realize big data is the future, mm -hmm. but um, I'm not tech savvy, and I'm really not interested in technology. Mm -hmm. So how would you encourage me as an entrepreneur to get immersed in the field so I could change the future from the inside out? So I think there are, there, are, you know, there are two sides to this question. So uh, when you say immerse in the field, you want to get involved in it, or you are saying a non-big data way to? I most definitely want to get immersed in the field, but not yeah. in a technological way. So I want to utilize yeah. the technology, but mm -hmm. that's not what I want to be interacting with on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, so I think there, you know, there are, if you go to the uh, sort of the application layer, so what we are doing is infrastructure, but if you look at what big data enables, there are lots of applications out there. And so I, I was at this uh, Strata uh, conference, a big conference in our area, and so uh, Cloudera, which is a big application company, that sits on top of uh, what we do, they have this uh, competition uh, on innovative ideas. And so their CEO was talking in a small gathering about what they were seeing. Uh, so that last year, the same uh, contest as a sponsor, there were all the entries where you know, we saved uh, X million dollars on fraud protection, um, you know, Y million dollars by having a better deployment and all that. He said, now, a year later, there are some really interesting things that they are doing. So people are doing things like, so they, one big data application he talked about was, he said, there are in hospitals, people routinely die because they are mistreated, you know, they have got allergic reactions, things that, you know, are unanticipated, right? Accidental deaths. So somebody came up with this idea of looking at the medical history and before such an accidental death, taking a whole bunch of those, uh, running, you know, machine learning algorithms on that to predict what might actually create some of these things. And they've, they're, they actually talked about how many lives they've saved because of that. That was one. Another thing he said, he said, you know, there are a lot of uh, child sex traffic happens through uh, wanted ads. So, you know, ads that, you know, people respond to and they get trapped. They are written by, uh, you know, and people get other kids to write this once they are in the ring. And their patterns. So somebody looked at all the wanted ads that were known to be, you know, uh, with a criminal background. And ran that through big data application. And it was a non-profit organization. They saved 30 kids in the last one year who would otherwise ended up in the sex traffic uh, you know, business. So the reason why I say this is that when you talk about infrastructure, it's very geeky. But when you start at the application level, there are a lot of applications out there which are very intuitive. You just need an idea. And you don't need to be the guy who actually implements the complex neural network, machine learning, conjugate gradient algorithm to solve that. You can be on the marketing side, or you can be on the, uh, you know, sort of the business side of it. So there are a lot of things you can do. And the infrastructure now is getting to the point where if you have an idea that kind of intuitively makes sense, there's probably a way to prototype that. So I think that's what I would advise. I mean, just look around, look at, uh, you know, cloud, some of these contests that are going on out there. There's a lot of interesting things you can do. Uh, and it's really only your imagination that's uh, going to limit you. So you mentioned the pros and cons of going in the industry full time and also working your own startup. What are your thoughts on doing your own startup while you're doing a full time job? Uh, while doing a full time job or in school? Full time job. Full time job. I think it depends. It can get very messy. It depends on what a full time job is. Uh, but you can get into all kinds of uh, you know IP issues and things like that. So. I would just, be, that's the first thing I would be careful about. And I think beyond that, you can bootstrap a little bit. I, there are 
uh, you can do a few things, but I think eventually it doesn't really uh, scale. Uh, I think also uh, you really need to, at some point, need to take some risk. You can do some contract work on the side, but I, I would think full-time job is probably uh, you know, uh, too much of a burden if you're doing a good job of it to also do a startup on the side. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm wondering about uh, who Robin Sister, uh, who Robin Systems primarily hires: uh, statistics majors, computer science majors, because uh, there aren't a lot of data science majors out there. I know Berkeley is working on a major. Yeah, that's right. so. So we are we are on the infrastructure side. So we hire people who have got a lot of operating system background, file systems, storage. Uh, so a lot of CS guys. Uh, you know, with, with core uh, solid CS background. So then we have got people doing analytics on top of it. So we have had a few people, uh, you know, who are looking at that. But uh, like you said, there are not really any quote unquote existing data scientists who have spent 15 years doing that. Most of the data scientists are people who have, uh, you know, moved into that area recently. So we have got a, a few people who are focusing on analytics, but they are themselves transitioning for something else. Uh, so if you look at the core expertise, it's almost all pure CS. Expertise. Um, I have one last question. Yeah. I am curious why it's called Robin Systems. It's our founder's daughter picked that name. And we, we talked about, you know, on the marketing side, that it's really the, the best name because, you know, when you just type Robin, a million other things come up. And uh, in the end, we decided to stay with it because what we found was that in our space, everybody has got a, such a funky, cool name that we found that when we went to our first conference, people remembered us because we were old school. Uh, and so we said we'll stay with that. So, thank you for taking the time. To Thank you.